Join me now is Jelani Cobb, a staff writer for The New Yorker and an MSNBC political contributor and a dean of the Columbia Journalism School. His latest New Yorker piece is titled The Enduring Power of Trumpism. No matter what becomes of Donald Trump, the forces of intolerance, racism and belligerence he harnessed in American politics will persist. Also with me is Tara Satmeyer, senior advisor at The Lincoln Project and host of the organization's streaming show, The Breakdown. She's also a former Republican communications director, but left the party in November of 2020 after the election. Jelani, Trumpism will always have an audience ready to buy in. Do you think that what he has brought to the Republican Party in the mainstream, do you think it's going to stay? I mean, your title says it is, but what and if it's him, is he still a stand bearer? So, you know, it, it, it's really not pertinent in some mm. ways, it, whether or not he's the standard bearer. You know, you, the important thing to recall is that, you know, just as within his career uh, as a builder, uh, you know, in construction, he was better for branding than he was for act, better known for branding than he was for actually building things. And so the elements that we see uh, that created the havoc uh, that we've witnessed in the past six years in American politics weren't original to Trump. Uh, he did a tremendous uh, increase in the branding of those things and coalescing those things into a kind of singular uh, entity uh, in the similar way that Joseph McCarthy did. You know, red baiting uh, preceded Joseph McCarthy and continued after McCarthy's political demise. Uh, and so those elements and the fact that he has marketed them and injected them into the mainstream, that he has demonstrated just how many norms you can shatter, uh, that you can attempt to overthrow uh, a, the government effectively and still be considered a, a political figure in good standing uh, within you know, the elements of the Republican Party. All of those things point to a much deeper set of problems than the political lifespan of any single individual, you know, Donald Trump uh, or anyone else. Yeah, I mean, Terry, you left the Republican Party in 2020 because of its embrace of Trumpism. Do you think that folks at the party are now abandoning Trump or are they doing it for the same principle reasons, you think, or something different? <laughs> well, it's clearly not based on principle because mm. Donald Trump did plenty prior to his election denial lie and then the insurrection. Um, he never should have been elected in the first place. If Republicans were um, operating on principle, they would have rejected him back in 2016. But instead, you had too many Republicans running vanity candidacies that split the vote in the primary that allowed the 30 percent of hardcore primary voters to um, vote Donald Trump in. And then they were like, oh, my goodness, what are we going to do now? OK, we can manage him. Well, many of us knew you were never going to be able to manage a malignant narcissist like Donald Trump, who's not only ignorant, but willfully ignorant of how our constitutional system works and frankly despises it just based on the way he governed. And Republicans sat there and enabled this for all of those years. But now, now they're pearl clutching because they got their you know, butts handed to them in, in elections that they should have won. And so, unfortunately, it's the cynical aspect of, of elected offices where they are single seekers of reelection and political actors usually do not respond until they lose electorally. I've warned about this and I think that's a shame. It wasn't anything else. And to Jelani's point, all of the things that Trumpism, which has, I think, outgrown Donald Trump, and that is the danger. Sure. All of the malignancy of Trumpism, which in, in my in my um, video where I left the Republican Party in 2020, I talked about that. That is what concerns me, because now you have millions of people who believe this. Hmm. That takes a generation to extricate. How do we change that? You know, it's interesting that you say that because I grew up in California under Pete Wilson and the chilling effect that he had on the community of immigrants and people of color is still being felt. And I think that you're absolutely right. So, Jelani, I want to ask you a question based on what you wrote. For critical observers, it has been apparent that everything Trump offered the public came slathered in snake oil. That is either a statement about the willful blindness of the American public or a barometer of how many Americans view those dangerous liabilities as assets. Now, my question to you is that the snake oil that you speak of, is it only from Donald Trump or does the snake oil also stick to different candidates? And I'm thinking of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. He's the one that comes to mind. Sure. I mean, so I think that irrespective of what Donald Trump's uh, political future is, he's established a playbook. 
Uh, and, you know, we see, you know, what the parameters of dishonesty and just the incredible mendacity uh, that characterized Trump's behavior uh, with, you know, just lie after lie after lie after lie uh, for a politician who lies half as much or three quarters as much. They look honest in comparison. Uh, and so it, it really is, you know, the problem, even whether it's Ron DeSantis or someone else, the problem is the parameters and the tolerance for the kinds of anti-democratic behaviors uh, that were mainstreamed and normalized during the Trump administration. No, I think that's right. And I think it's, it's incredibly dangerous. I, Tara, I want to ask you, is Ron DeSantis Trump 2.0? And a lot of people are asking this question, but one of the things that has been underreported is the fact that Ron DeSantis, yes, he won, but he highly gerrymandered the state of Florida. And oftentimes people say, well, but that was, a, you know, he was a statewide office. <clears throat> but gerrymandering has the impact of chilling potential voters uh, for the opposite side of going out and voting. There's no way that he could gerrymander himself across 50 states. So what would be his pathway? Well, he also can't gerrymander himself political charisma or retail <laughs> politics either. He, you said people, it. Like, every, uh, yes, I did. <laughs> I'll say it. Um, because people in the Republican Party, the gentry Republicans, think that they have now found their savior in Ron DeSantis because of his performance in Florida and because he, the way he is governed. And they think, okay, yes, he's he's Trump without all of the um, the ethical, personal obnoxiousness. Well, uh, obviously, they haven't seen Ron DeSantis outside of Florida. He was a seat Congress that no one really knew before Donald Trump propped him up. And you see that, that Ron DeSantis has begun to fashion himself in the image and likeness of Trump, even to the way he, you know, ma his mannerisms and everything. And it's so transparent. When he gets on the ground in New Hampshire and Iowa, people are going to see that this guy doesn't have it. You cannot, Donald Trump's uh, political gravity defying, uh, you know, tactics do not apply to everyone else. And so it's going to be a rude awakening for folks that think Ron DeSantis is their is the Republican savior. Um, also, you need to look at the way that they he governs in Florida. I mean, this is a guy who who took, who created a, basically an election Gestapo force to go out and intimidate voters after um, uh, felons were allowed to vote again. But there were a couple of loopholes, and he sends out this this election integrity force and arrests people that sent a chilling effect uh, mm -hmm. uh, of voter intimidation and suppression, among a litany of other things from the culture wars, going after Disney. They really Republicans really want to scale that up now. Um, I think they have another thing coming on a national level. So, yes, gerrymandering uh, was a was an issue. It also was an issue in New York for the Democrats. It's something that I think is part of our electoral reforms that we need to look at moving forward to help open up the system that that seemed to be a danger to the system that inc that encourage um, more extreme candidates in some places. But that's a whole different set of, <laughs> of issues talking about gerrymandering and primary reform, but something that should be on the table. Tara, so I'm glad that you actually mentioned it, because I do think that most Americans regardless of party, are tired of these nail biters, and we don't need to. We can modernize our election systems in ways that Australia has done it, the way New Zealand has done it. There's plenty of democracies that we can learn from, so I'm glad that you highlighted it, but I also am glad that you're highlighting this the fashioning of DeSantis against Donald Trump. It wasn't until you mentioned that that I looked closely in the pictures and I'm realizing that it may, it may also be the fake bake that he's doing. Jelani Cobb and Tara Setmeyer, thank you so much for joining me this morning.